بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين مولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن سبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد Our respected brothers, elders, sisters, esteemed scholars السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Uh, the topic is uh, the sacred conquests and obviously the conference is about uh, prophecies. Generally, when a prophet prophesizes something, predicts something, he's often met with ridicule from the people around him. So he'll get mocked, ridiculed, why? Because generally what he is prophesizing and what he is saying is too far-fetched to be believed. So they will turn around and they will say, that's impossible. That can't happen. So generally the people around him will mock him. They will laugh him, they will scold at him, they will ridicule him. That is the vast majority of people. But then you have another group of people who will actually believe what a prophet is saying. Why? Because they are people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning of the Quran speaks about. Allah says, Alif la meem, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه. The book, this book has no doubt in it. هُدَلِّ للمتقين. A guidance for those who are people of taqwa, people who are God-fearing, God-conscious. الذين يؤمنون بالغيب. And the first characteristic of these people is that they believe in the unseen. The first characteristics of those people who are the muttaqeen is that they have a certain belief in the unseen. And one of the greatest examples of this in the life of the Messenger of Allah was when the Messenger of Allah went for the Mi'raj, for the Isra and the Mi'raj. And when the message of Allah came back, one of the first people he bumped into was Abu Jahal. So Abu Jahal said, he said sarcastically, he said, Oh Muhammad, what's new? What's the latest? You know, you're always having revelations. What's the latest now? And the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Yes, last night I traveled from Mecca to Jerusalem. And he said, what? You did that last night? He said, it doesn't finish there. From there, I went to the heavens. Abu Jahl said, you serious? He said, if I gather the people of Makkah, are you ready to say this in front of them? And the Messenger of Allah said, yes. So he gathers the people. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi says, last night I traveled from Mecca to Bayt al-Maqdis, to Jerusalem. And they said, you did this in the portion of last night. He said, yes, but it doesn't finish there. From there, I went to the heavens. And the narration mentioned some of them began to clap. Some of them placed their hands on their heads. Some of them began to slap their thighs. So they said, even Abu Bakr won't take this one. He won't believe this one. And Abu Bakr was the right-hand man of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if Abu Bakr does not believe this, then the dawah of the message of Allah falls apart. So they go to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and they say, Abu Bakr, did you hear what your man saying? He said, what's he saying? He said, last night, he's saying that last night he traveled from Mecca to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to the heavens. And Abu Bakr said, awaqala thalik. They said, yes. He said, did he actually say that? And they said, yes. Abu Bakr replied, Idan Sadaq, then he's speaking the truth. For how many a times I'm sitting next to him, and the angel from the heaven, Jibra'il, descends from the heavens to him. 
on occasion, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to take him to the heavens, what's so astonishing about that? This is the characteristic. Those who believe in the unseen. See, throughout history, people have predicted. And some of the predictions are amazing. But generally, they're one of predictions. You have people like Nostradamus. He predicted, he predicted a number of things. But really, study the predictions of Nostradamus. They're vague, obscure, ambiguous, open to interpretation. But you look at the predictions of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Many of them are bang on. They make your hair stand on its end. That's how accurate this statement of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were. And today I want to speak about something specific. And that is the military expeditions which the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke about within his lifetime. And I am not going through the entire list. I am just going to touch on three or four, depending on how much time I have. That's it. One of the most difficult times in the life of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the time of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum was the occasion of Ahzab or Khandaq, the battle of Ahzab. This was a battle where all the enemies of Islam gathered together and they marched on Medina and they were saying that this will be the final battle. After this, the Muslims will never stand. There were approximately 11,000. The Muslims were 3,000. A thousand from amongst them were munafiqun. So they were a fraction of the number of their enemies. And now the enemies march on to Medina. And Salman al-Farsi says to the Messenger of Allah, he said, you know when we have a large army that we can't contest, what we do is we dig a trench. So the Muslims begin to dig a trench in Medina. There's only two ways that you can enter Medina. One is from the front and the other is from the back. The sides have lava, you can't enter. At the back you have Bani Quraitha, the Jewish tribe who have a treaty with the Muslims that anybody who attack the Muslims, they will defend the Muslims. It's midwinter. There is a famine going on. The Sahaba come to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they remove their garment from their stomach, and they have a stone tied to their stomachs. And the Messenger of Allah removes his garment, and he has two stones tied to his stomach. And whilst they're digging this trench, they come through this large boulder, huge rock, which they can't break. So they call the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes. And he strikes it. And there's a huge spark and he says, Allah Akbar. And then he strikes it for the second time and there's a huge spark and the message of Allah says, Allah Akbar. And then he strikes it a third time and there's a huge spark and he says, Allah Akbar. And the Sahaba say, oh message of Allah, what was that Allah Akbar? What was that spark about? And the Prophet ﷺ said, when I struck it the first time, Allah showed me through that spark that a day would come that we would take the palaces of Yemen. When I struck it the second time, Allah showed me through that spark that a day would come that we would take the palaces of Sham. And when I struck it the third time, Allah showed me a day would come that we would take the white palace of Madain of the Persian, the superpower of the day. And the Munafiqoon began to say, look at this man. One of us is scared to go and relieve himself, go to the toilet, and he's promising them that they will be the superpower of the day. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recalled this in the Quran. It's one reality, but two people are looking at it. And Allah says, وَإِذْ يَقُولُ وَإِذْ يَقُولُ الْمُنَافِقُونَ وَالَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٍ that when the munafiqeen and those who had an illness in their heart, they said, what Allah and His Rasul have promised us is nothing besides deception. He's promising them that they will be the superpower of the day. It's a deception. And then Allah recalls what the believer said. al-ahzaba." قَالُوا هَذَا مَا وَعْدَنَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُ وَصَدَقَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُ When the believers saw that the army, the confederates, they said, 
This is what Allah is Rasul has promised us, and Allah and His Rasul have spoken the truth. They're both looking at the same thing. The Manafiqun are looking at the same thing. The Muslims are looking at the same thing. But one is looking at it through the prism and the lens of Iman. And one is looking at it through the prism and the lens of disbelief and kufr. So they see different things. The reality is the same, but they perceive it differently. But subhanallah, in this narration, the message of Allah said, a time will come that we will take Sham. What was Sham in those days? Sham in those days was Palestine, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, portion of Turkey, small portion of Egypt, and a small portion of Iraq. This was Sham in that time. Who ruled Sham? The Christians did. The Christian kingdom could be divided into two. One was the Western Christian kingdom, which center was Rome. And the second was the Byzantine Empire, which the capital was Constantinople, now Istanbul. And they went all the way to Sham. And the message of Allah is telling them that a day will come that you will take the second most powerful force on the face of this earth, and many people mocked. But within a period of 10 years, the Muslims took Sham. Within a period of 10 years. But I want to go deal with something more specific. Within Sham, you had Palestine. Within Palestine, within Palestine you had Bayt al-Maqdis, you had Masjid al-Aqsa. The Messenger of Allah said, count Six things because they will occur before the day of judgment or before the final hour. One is my death, and the second one he said was Bayt al Maqdis. So, in the 15th year, you have the Battle of Yarmouk, which was the a major battle between the Muslims and the Christians, the Byzantines. The Muslims defeat them. After this day, the Christians leave. The, the Byzantines leave. And then Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah radiallahu anhu writes a letter to Umar ibn Khattab, who was the Mir al Mu'mineen at that time. He said, What shall we do next? So Umar said, Now go to Bayt al Maqdis, go to Jerusalem, go to Al Aqsa, because the Messenger of Allah prophesied that we would capture it. So they come and they lay siege to Jerusalem. And the patriarch comes out. And he says to Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, he said, I will only give the keys to Umar ibn Khattab, nobody else. What was the reason? The ulama give two reasons. One possibly because they had signs of Umar in their books. Or secondly, because they had heard about the justice of Umar ibn Khattab. So they write a letter to Umar ibn Khattab. And Umar does mashra with the Shah, Sahaba. Some say go, some say don't go. But Umar was going. Umar only traveled to Sham. Out of the Hijaz, Umar went nowhere else besides Sham. Why did he go? Because he heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, Pray in Masjid Al-Aqsa. And if you cannot pray in Masjid Al-Aqsa, then send oil to burn the lantern. And Umar had this opportunity, and this is an amazing statement. Because when the Messenger of Allah said pray in Masjid Aqsa, it was ruled by the Christians. The Muslims didn't have it. But this is a prophecy that one day you will have it. And what does it mean that if you cannot pray in Masjid Aqsa, send oil to burn the lantern? It means, the ulama say it means, assist Masjid Al-Aqsa. Three, a third holiest sit, uh, masjid. Assist Masjid Aqsa. So Umar leaves, radiallahu anhu. He, him and one khadim. One camel, most powerful man on the face of the earth at that time. And he leaves on this camel and him and his servant are having turns to ride the camel. And they reach a place called Jabiyah. And this is where the people are waiting for Umar ibn Khattab. And now when they reach Jabiyah, it's the Khadim's turn to ride and Umar says, Rule, ride. And the Khadim says, Omir al there's tens of thousands of people waiting here to see you, receive you. 
You ride. Omar says, no, no, you will ride. Because honor is for those who fulfill their promises. So Omar walks into Jabiyah with the reins in his hands and the Khadim on the camel. But Omar remained Omar. And the Khadim remained the Khadim. And then he meets the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. And he speaks to them. And Abu Baydat ibn Jarrah is there, Khalid ibn Walid is there, Sharahbil ibn Hasna is there, Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, many other Sahaba radiallahu anhum are there. And he says to Abu Baydat ibn Jarrah, one of the ten who were guaranteed Jannah by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Abu Baydat, take me to your house. And Abu Baydat says, Amir al-Mu'mini, why do you want to come to my house for? If you come to my house, the only thing will happen is that you will rinse out your eyes. He said, no, take me to your house. So Omar goes to his house. He's the most powerful man in, in Sham, Abu Baydat al Jarrah. This is the outpost of the Muslim, the richest part of the Muslim world. And he lives in a mud hut. And Omar enters the house and he looks around the home. And there's hardly anything in the home. And Omar says, give me something to eat. So he brings him some water and he gives him some crumbs. So Omar says, is this all that you have? And Abu Baydah says, oh Amir al muminin it's enough to get me to the other side. And Omar begins to cry. And Omar says, the dunya has changed all of us, oh Abu Baydah, besides you. The dunya has impacted and changed us all besides you. And then Omar begins to cry and Abu Baydah says, I told you, Amir al muminin you're going to come to my house and you're going to rinse your eyes. And then it's time for him to meet the patriarch. So they approach Umar ibn Khattab, two different people. And they say, Umir al-Mu'mineen, you know these leaders here, they live a pomp, lavish lifestyle. Your clothes, you have 16 patches on your clothes. For a little while, change your clothes and then... Just for a little while, because we don't want you to waste your journey. You came all the way from Medina. And these people expect other leaders to dress like them. So in some narrations it mentioned that Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu went into the tent. And he changed. And then he came out of the tent with his new clothes on. And he took a few steps and he turned to Abu Baydah ibn al-Jarrah. And he said, Ya Abu Baydah. We were a disgraced and a base nation, Abu Baydah, and Allah honored us with Islam. Where will we be if we leave the teachings of Islam? He went into the tent, he took off these new clothes and he wore his own clothes. And then he went to meet the patriarch at the door of Damascus. The Babu Dimash still remains where Umar ibn Khattab entered. And he signed a treaty and he was given the keys. And then the patriarch began to cry. And Umar ibn Khattab said, what are you crying for? Don't cry. These are days, you know, sometimes victory for us, sometimes victory for you. That's how life is. He said, that's not why I'm crying. He said, I'm crying because nations are established and sustained on the basis of justice. And as long as that the, the Muslim will have people like you and those around you, we will never take this place back again. He said, that's why I'm crying. And then Umar radiallahu anhu went into the masjid and he began to clean the sahra, the dome of the rock. Why? Because this was a rubbish tip to the Christians because the Christians believed that the Jews had sacrificed Isa alayhi salatu salam on the dome of the rock. So what they would do, they would throw all their rubbish. A woman would take the most dirtiest thing in the house and she would dump it there. So Umar radiallahu anhu began to clean this with the other sahaba radiallahu anhu. And then Umar prayed two rakats like the messenger of Allah told the sahaba to pray two rakats. And then come the time for salah. And Umar moves forward and he praises the, 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 the first salah time. And now they're waiting for the Adhan. And Bilal is there. 
After the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, Bilal never gave that dhan. So Umar goes to Bilal and he says, Bilal, give that dhan. And Bilal refuses. He said, give that dhan. And Bilal refuses. And Umar insists. Eventually he convinces Bilal. And Bilal stands up and he says, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. And the Sahaba are all sitting there. Those Sahaba, when they embraced Islam, their beards were black and now it turned gray. All of them became drenched with tears because it reminded them of the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Umar cried so much that they had to console him. And then they prayed their salah and this is known as the Qibli Masjid in Al-Aqsa. Where Umar ibn Khattab prayed their salah with the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. And then Omar sitting there and he begins to cry. And the Sahaba say, Why are you crying for Amirul Mu'mineen? It's a day of victory. It's a day of fulfilling the prophecy of the Messenger of Allah. It's a day of us taking the third most holiest masjid. And Omar says, I know, but I remember the words of the Messenger of Allah. Look at the inside of Omar ibn Khattab. He said, I remember the words of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting on the pulpit and he said, It is not shirk that I fear for you. But it is the dunya that it is unfolds in front of you. And you begin to compete in it like those who competed before you. And you will be destroyed like those who were destroyed before you. He said, that's what I'm remembering. That's what I'm remembering. Look at this prophecy. In the most difficult time in the life of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the battle of Ahzab, the Messenger of Allah is promising them that you will defeat Sham. You will defeat the Byzantines. Let me ask you a question. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take the Messenger of Allah to Bayt al-Maqdis? Why did He take Him to Masjid Aqsa? Why didn't He just take Him straight to the heavens? You know, yesterday, I spoke to you about the salah in the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu yeah, Can you imagine that salah that the messenger Bilal gives the adhan? The messenger of Allah leads the salah and the sahaba, the greatest of people after the Anbiya Alayhi to walk on the face of this earth are behind the messenger of Allah. And when he finishes his surah Fatah, they say, Ameen. Can you imagine the khushu of that salah? Can you imagine the intensity and the sincerity of that salah? There was only one salah which was greater than this salah. This was the salah when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa led the Anbiya in Masjid al-Aqsa. When the, in the Sufuf, it wasn't Abu Bakr, it was Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam. It wasn't Umar, it was Yusuf alayhi salatu salam. It wasn't Khalid bin Walid, but it was Shoaib alayhi salatu salam. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from Mecca to Bayt al-Maqdis? Why didn't he take him to the heavens? Because Allah wanted to show the believers the importance of Masjid al-Aqsa. That's why. You know, in Ramadan, I went to Masjid al-Aqsa. And subhanallah, you know, you read so much about Masjid al-Aqsa. And I met some, actually, Brothers from uh, Malaysia, elderly gentlemen, they were there as well. Just a few, because uh, obviously I don't think you have diplomatic ties with Israel. And you know what? And just before I came here, I, w I came to Spain. So basically I came back at 2 o'clock and then three, at 9 o'clock at night I came here. I go to Spain twice a year. The Muslims ruled Spain for 800 years. 800 years. In the time of Abdul Rahman II, the most powerful nation on the first of this earth. In the time of Abdul Rahman, Ad Nasir, again the most powerful nation. Where are, are the Muslims? Where is Imam Qurtubi? Where is Ibn Abdul Bar? Where is Ibn Hazm? Gone. After this, the ulama and, and, and the people, the Muslims, wrote poetry. They wrote poetry about Undulus, and they still write poetry. Imam Shoki wrote poetry. Allah Iqbal wrote poetry. But Muslims did nothing when, when the occupation was going on. And wallahi, you know, I fear a day will come that Muslims will lose Masjid Aqsa. When they lose Masjid Aqsa, they will write poetry. 
Aqsa, we cry for you. Oh, Aqsa, we do this. When you were crying, we were laughing. Now you are this and we are, you know, I'm not much of a poet as you gathered. But, but nothing is done. And Allah, and the message of Allah specifically said, That one of the signs will be that we will take Masjid Aqsa. Why did he specify Masjid Aqsa? Because of its importance. In the same narration I mentioned earlier on, the Battle of Ahzab, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that a day will come that we will take the palaces of the superpower of the day. The Persians. Who were the Persians? The Persians had been a superpower for 1200 years. From Iraq all the way up to India, they ruled. Besides for a short portion, they were defeated by the Greeks. For 1200 years straight, they were a superpower. You know, we've been around for about 1400 years. You look at the ebbs and the flows and the highs and the lows that we've gone through. This is how powerful they were. Their capital was in Iraq in a place called Madain. And the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a day will come that we will defeat them. People couldn't believe this. It was too astonishing for them. It's impossible. How do you defeat a group of people like the Persians? When Adi ibn Hatim, Adi ibn Hatim was a Christian prince. He was an Arab. When Islam spread, he didn't want to live under the Muslims. So he moved to the non-Arab Christian lands. But he didn't like it there. And he kept on hearing about this man called Muhammad. So he eventually decided now that he's going to go and meet Muhammad. So he goes into Medina and he's walking with the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And all of a sudden this African slave woman stands in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she says, oh messenger of Allah, speak to my master for he overburdens me. Speak to him. And Adi says, I knew this man wasn't a king or a prince because you can't stop kings and princes in the middle of the street. And then the Messenger of Allah said to this lady who was a slave, he said to her, he said, take my hand to any street in Medina and ask me for assistance, I will assist you. And Adi ibn Hatim says, I knew that this man was something special. And then he goes to the house, and then he's walking on, and a man comes with his child. And he says to the Messenger of Allah, he says, Messenger of Allah, I'm hungry, my child is hungry. And the Messenger of Allah had nothing to give him. So the Messenger of Allah took him to the side. He consoled him. He told him to do sabr, and he carries on. And as he's watching all this, he comes past another man. And this man comes to the Messenger of Allah, and he says, the Messenger of Allah, we can't even leave Medina. We have no security. We are so afraid that we can't even leave Medina. And the Messenger of Allah takes him to the side. He consoles him and he tells him, have sabr. And then the Messenger of Allah takes Adi to his house and he gives him the pillow. And Adi says, no, you take the pillow. And the Messenger of Allah insists. And Adi took the pillow. And then the Messenger of Allah gave him dawah. So Adi embraced Islam. And Adi said, Oh Muhammad, I am already a man of religion. I don't need another religion. So the Messenger of Allah said, I know more about Christianity than you do. And Adi says, he began to speak about Christianity and I marveled about his knowledge regarding Christianity. And then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Adi, he said, Oh Adi, I swear by Allah a day will come that a woman will walk from Hira in Iraq all by herself and she will come to the Kaaba and she will do tawaf around the Kaaba all by herself and nobody will interfere with her. He said, I swear by Allah, a day will come that we will take the treasures and the bangles of the Kisra. And Adi said, what? You telling me that a day will come that you will take the bangles and the treasures of Kisra, the most powerful man on the face of this earth. You know what the bangles and the treasures of Kisra were. Every morning before the Kisra had an audience with anybody, they would close the curtains. They would lower a crown upon his head, which weighed 14 stones. More than the most of you weigh here. And it would have 
suspended from the ceiling with a gold chain because obviously he'd break his neck. And then he would have these bangles on and these beautiful jewelry on. And then they would open the curtain and anybody who would see him would become overawed. And he's seeing the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa He's just met people who don't have no food to eat. He's met people who can't even leave Medina. And the message of Allah is saying to him, a day will come that we will take the treasures of Al-Kisra. He said, oh, Adi, a day will come that people will go out and give their zakat and there will be nobody who will want to take their zakat. Later, Adi embraces Islam. And he says, by Allah, with my own eyes, I saw women traveling from Hira all the way to the Kaaba doing tawaf by themselves and nobody interfered with them. He said, I was in that army which took the treasures of Kisra. And he says, I haven't seen it yet. It hasn't occurred. But by Allah, a day will come that people will go out and give their zakat and there will be nobody to take their zakat. Where Adi started from doubt, amazement, astonishment, and then he reached the state of yaqeen. From ilmul yaqeen, it became ainul yaqeen. He saw it with his own eyes. He saw it with his own eyes. You know this bangles, which the Messenger of Allah spoke about. When the Messenger of Allah sallallahu was doing hijrah, the Messenger of Allah promised those bangles of kisra to a man who wanted to kill him. The Messenger of Allah is migrating and the Mushrikeen put a bounty of a hundred camels on the head of the Messenger of Allah. They said, anybody dead or alive, we will give you a hundred camels if you find Muhammad. So a man, he spots the Messenger of Allah, Abu Bakr. And he goes to his people and he said, I think I saw Muhammad and Abu Bakr. And there's a man in the gathering called Suraqat ibn Malik. Suraqat ibn Malik wants to take the bounty himself. So he said, he said, no, 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 I know who those people, they were somebody else. So after a while, Suraka slips out from the gathering, he goes home, he jumps on his horse, he takes his sword, and he goes behind the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And Suraka narrates this himself. Suraka says, I was coming closer and closer to him. He said, I came so close to Muhammad that I could hear his recitation of the Quran. So there was one man who kept on looking back and there was one man who did not look back at all. He says that the one man who looking back began to cry. That was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu because he was concerned about the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Suraka says, I came so close to the message of Allah that I could hear his recitation of the Quran. And then all of a sudden, the four legs of my horse sank into the ground and I fell off my horse. Suraka was a warrior. Suraka never fell off his horse. And Suraka says, I jumped back on my horse and I went back behind Muhammad. And again, I fell off my horse. He said, I jumped on my horse the third time. I went behind him again. And again, I fell off my horse and I realized that this man was something special. This man had something that other people did not have. And he does not even look back. And he carries on walking. And then I shout, I say, oh Muhammad, wait. Oh Muhammad, wait. He said, oh Muhammad, give me guarantee. Give me a guarantee that when you will take the lands, that I will have protection from you. And the message of Allah says, on one condition, that you cover our tracks. He agrees. The message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to write, that Suraqat ibn Malik has a guarantee from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And he gives him the letter. Suraqa returns, Suraqa says, I left with the intention of killing Muhammad, I returned protecting him. When approximately in the 15th, 16th year, 15th year, the Muslims defeat the Persians in the Battle of Qadziyah, but then Battle of Nahwand, and then they walk into the White Palace. They gather all the treasures of Kisra and they send it to Medina. Umar ibn Khattab is Amir al muminin The treasures reach Umar ibn Khattab. Umar sees the bangles and he had heard what the Messenger of Allah said to Suraqat ibn Malik. And Suraqat had embraced Islam by then. And he calls Suraqat ibn Malik. 
And so Raqqa comes. And he comes to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa He comes to Umar ibn Khattab. And Umar takes those bangles and he puts them on the arms of Suraka. And then he says, Suraka, walk through the streets of Medina. And raise your arms high. So people can see that the prophecy of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa has come to pass. Look at this, subhanallah. These are not guesses. Whatever the message of Allah spoke was from wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he predicted that they would defeat, prophesy that they would defeat the two superpowers of the day. Let me move on to some, a third thing. The message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke about a group of people that Muslim would have an encounter with. He never said that the Muslim would defeat them. But the Muslims would have an encounter with these people. The narration are related by Imam Bukhari, Ibn Majah, Ibn uh, Imam Suyuti, in Al Jami Sagir, and many others with different varying narrations. I'm going to read it out to you, and then I'll go through these people. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, The hour will not be established until you fight with people with small eyes and with broad faces. Their eyes will look like the eyes of locusts. Their faces will be like shields coated with leather. They will have shoes made of hair. They will have leather shields and will tie their horses into palm trees. And in another narration, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says again, they will be wearing shoes of hair. And they will have red faces and flat noses. Who is the Messenger of Allah speaking about? And why does the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa speak about these people? The most difficult time in the history of Islam upon the Muslim Ummah was the encounter with the Turkic Mongols. If you gather all the suffering of the Muslims today, it does not compare with a fraction of what the Muslims went through under the Mongols. The Mongols ravaged the Muslim world. They reached Moscow, Bulgaria, Poland. But Western historians say what they did to the Muslim in cruelty was unparalleled. They decimated the Muslim world. When they reached Bukhara, when they reached Bukhara, they gathered all the Muslims in the Masajid and they butchered them all in the Masajid. When they went to Samarkand, they took the people outside Samarkand and they killed them and then they took off their heads and they made pyramids out of their heads. When they reached Gurgang, Juwaini says that there were 50,000 Soldiers, Mongol soldiers under Genghis Khan. 50,000. Each soldier had 24 people that he executed. You know how much that is? 1.2 million people. 1.2 million. Ibn Athir says, For many years, I wanted to write about the history of the Mongols and what they did. He said, By Allah, every time I take my pen to paper, my heart doesn't allow me to. The message of Allah described them. Look how he described them. Look at the way he described them. He had never seen a Mongol in his life. Never. And the Mongols came hundreds of years after him. Even the first small encounter with the Muslim, with the Mongols was in the time of Muawiyah. But that was a small encounter. But the reason he mentioned them was because of the way they decimated the Muslim world. He had never seen a Mongol. But look at the way he described the faces. He says that they wore shoes made out of hair. Indicating to what? A cold place. And you look at the Mongol pictures until today. You will see that the pictures are with them wearing shoes of hair. And then the Mongols from there, after Genghis Khan passed away, his grandson Halugu, they walked on Baghdad. Baghdad was ruled by the Abbasids. It was the Caliphate. Baghdad was the most beautiful city in the world at that time. The population of Baghdad was 1.8 million. 
Mu'tasim was the Khalifa of the Abbasid at that time. Mu'tasim wrote a letter, don't try to fight with us. Halugu said, you will see what I do to you. Halugu besieged Baghdad. Eventually, Mu'tasim cons consulted his advisors and they said, look, ask him for terms. Halugu made one condition. He said, if you want to speak to me, I don't want to just speak to you. Bring all your advisors and all your ulama. He took 700 of his closest men to see Halugu. Halugu only allowed 18 to enter the tent. Only 18 to enter the tent. The rest of them, they took him to the side and they killed every single one. The cream of the crop. And Motasim is standing in front of Halugu, he's shaking. Motasim, Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Khalifa. People would stand in his court and they would shake. Today he's shaking. And Halugu says, go back to your people and tell them, put down their arms. So he goes back and he tells the people, put down their arms. And they put down their arms. And then Halugu gives the command. Kill every Muslim that you can get your hand on. For the next 40 days, they butchered Muslims in Baghdad. In those days, you didn't have bombs or machine guns. They would line them up. And they would take days for their turn sometimes to come. And they would pluck them out of the line like you pluck a chicken from a poultry farm. And then they would butcher them. They say a woman, a, a Mongol woman would walk into a Muslim house. She would kill everybody. The Muslim was so scared they wouldn't do nothing to a woman. She would say to a Muslim man, stand there, let me go and get my knife. And he was so petrified that he would not move from his place. Muslims dug graves and they hid in the graves to save themselves. They ate cats, dogs and even corpuses to survive. After 40 days, then he said, stop. He entered Baghdad. He said the stench of the dead was so much that he could not remain in Baghdad. He walked back out. The entire population was 1.8 million. Half of the entire population was killed. I come from Birmingham. The Birmingham population is approximately the same. It is the second largest city in the UK. Can you imagine? And then he brings the children of Motosim, three children, he kills them in front of him. Then he brings his sisters and brothers and kills them in front of him. And then he throws them in a prison. And Motosim is hungry. But before he throws him into prison, he says to Motosim, he says, Motosim, where's your treasures? And Motosim brings his treasures. He said, no, not those treasures, the real treasures. Where have you hid them? In the middle of the palace, they had a hole. They dig up the hole. The narrations mention that so much treasure came out that it was like a small mountain. 500 years of, ha of the Abbasid Caliphate's treasures went up in one day. 500 years. Then they threw Mu'tasim in prison. And when they threw him in prison, he's starving. So Mu'tasim says, give me something to eat. So they, give, they send him a platter full of gold. So he said, I can't eat this. So Halugu calls him. He said, take him out of prison. Bring him here. And they bring him to Halugu. Halugu said, if you couldn't eat it, then why did you hoard it? Why did you save it? for? Why didn't you spend it on your men? So they would give their life for you. And then he took him to the gates of Baghdad. Baghdad had these huge iron gates. He said... These iron gates, what good are they if you don't have men to defend them? He said, it would have been better if you broke those iron down and made lances for your men. And you know what, you know what Mu'tasim said? He said, it's Qadrullah. Our defeat is Qadrullah. You know what Genghis Khan would say to the Muslims? He would say, I am the adhab of Allah upon you. I am the wrath of Allah upon you. You know what Halugu said to Mu'tasim? He said, Qadrullah, decree of Allah. He said, I will show you Qadrullah. They wrapped him up in a carpet and they trampled him with the horses. Europe was shaking in their shoes. They were scared of these people. 
They had heard about the Mongols. The Muslim Ummah became so disheartened, they would have a statement. They would say, In qila lak, inna tattara kadin hazmu falatu sabdiq. If anybody tells you that the Mongols have been defeated, don't believe them. Because these are people who are invincible. And then in the month of Ramadan, they come across Sayyiduddin Quds, literally a known man from Egypt, and he decimates them. He destroys the Mongols. Europe was shaking in their shoes. But within a period of 80 years, subhanAllah, these Mongols become Muslim. They become warriors of Islam. Why? Because within the Ummah, there were still people who gave the Dawah. And the amazing thing is, I have a talk called Dawah Power. If you find it on YouTube, I go through this. The vast majority of Dawah which was given to influential people were given Dawah by Muslim women who were in the Mongol homes. They concealed their Iman, but they gave Dawah. Their children became Muslims. But may one of the most amazing Dawah incidents was a man called Sheikh Jalaluddin. He was from Bukhara. The Mongols ruled all that area, you know, uh, Baghdad, etc. And, and, and all the way to Central Asia and, and some of the Middle East. He's from Bukhara. He's traveling one day and there's a prince called Talquq, Taymur Khan. Taqluq Taymur Khan. Taqluq loved to go and hunt. So one day he's going hunting. And these Muslims, Sheikh Jalaluddin and his followers are traveling through his land. And they don't know that they're not meant to be traveling here. And Taqluq sees them and he goes enraged. He said, how dare these people walk around here and I am hunting. He said, bring them to me, tie them up. So they bring Sheikh Jalaluddin. Finishing, one minute. Inshallah. Malaysian, one minute, yeah? Because every time I come to the airport, they always pick me up half an hour late in Malaysia. So this time I, I text them, I said, please come on time. This time I was two hours late. There's a... <laughs> so... Uh, so, Takluk, so Takluk says, bring him to me. Bring him to me. And now he wants to humiliate them. So he says to him, he's got his dogs for hunting. He says, tell me. Are you better or are my dogs better? He says to Sheikh Jalaluddin. And Sheikh Jalaluddin says, you know, the humility of this man changed the landscape of humanity and the landscape of history. Sheikh Jalaluddin says, if Allah forgives me, then I am better than your dogs. But if Allah doesn't forgive me, then your dogs are better than me. His words permeate the heart of Taymur Khan. Taymur says, untie this man. And he sits with Sheikh Jalaluddin. Sheikh Jalaluddin gives him dawah. And he's ready to embrace Islam, but he says, not yet. He said, I am about to climb the throne. I will soon be the king. I don't want to jeopardize that. Come back to me when I am the king. So Sheikh Jalaluddin passes away and he tells his son, make sure that you go to Taymur Khan and tell it, remind him of his promise. So Taymur Khan becomes the king. The son goes. He wants an audience. He can't have an audience with him. They won't allow him to speak to him. Eventually, what he does, he stands near the palace in the middle of the night and he gives the adhan. Taymur Khan wakes up and he's in rage. Who's this man waking me up in the middle of the night? So he said, bring this man to me. Let me deal with him. So they bring Sheikh Jalal Din's son. And then he says, reminds him, he said, he said Taymur, do you remember the promise that you made to my father? He said, and, and, and Taymur Khan says, by Allah, the day since I've ascended this throne, I've been waiting for Sheikh Jalaluddin to come to me for me to embrace Islam. He said, today you have come, I will embrace Islam. He embraces Islam. And that morning, the Fajr Azan is given from the palace. And the landscape to a great degree of the Mongol changes because of the Dawah of Sheikh Jalalud. All these things I have mentioned to you. The Sham, Persia, the Mongols was prophesied by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But not only that, Constantinople, the Messenger of Allah said, Indeed you will conquer Constantinople. And the mir which will conquer it will be the best of emirs. 
And the army which will conquer it will be the best of armies. 600 years after the message of Allah said this, the Muslims conquered Constantinople. This is why whatever the message of Allah said was revealed to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us firm believers in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah say, I mean, guys, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a firm, true conviction in the words of the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the words of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us united in this dunya and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reunite us in Jannah. For those who are khairan, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.